Hi, this is Chef Rick Moonen, interviewing from my studio here in Las Vegas. The name of my podcast is Ocean Raised. Here is what I get to dive deep into storytelling with the original gangsters of cuisine to find out where they started and what drives them today. Today, I connect with a longtime friend, influencer, a giant behind the scenes doing what he loves, a living idol of mine in the hospitality family. Waldy Maloof is a highly accomplished restaurateur, executive chef and author with over 35 years of experience in the restaurant operations and development, and has created his own successful contemporary cuisine known as Waldy Maloof Cuisine. Currently the senior director of food and beverage operations, as well as special projects manager for all of the Culinary Institute of America's restaurants. He oversees the operations in all these restaurants, 12 in total, and student dining of uh, all three campuses in New York, California, and Texas. He uh, renovated and opened six, re uh, six restaurant classrooms and The Egg, a student dining facility in Hyde Park, since joining the college based in Hyde Park. So I'm gonna go backwards in his, uh, his lifetime because I, I'm reading off of his resume actually, so, I, so that we don't forget anything. So we'll, we'll get, get into all of this. All right. so. Between 99 and 2013, he had two Beacon restaurants, two locations, one in New York and one in Stanford, Connecticut. He was the chief uh, operating officer, executive chef, and co-owner. He developed and designed this highly successful and critically acclaimed restaurant featuring open fire cooking, my favorite kind, always. Uh, from 2011 to 2014, high heat, uh, he had a high heat pizza burger tap in New York City. He was the founder owner who developed and designed a new concept with plans for development of a small regional chain of upscale, high quality, fast, casual restaurants. In, two, he, in 2005, he opened Waldi's Wood-Fired Pizza and Penne in New York. He was the founder and former owner, uh, designed and built an uh, innovative, successful pizza shop on 6th Avenue in Manhattan. It's still in existence today, but under a different ownership. Uh, from uh, 1995, we're going back now, 95 to 99, he was at the Rainbow Room, BE Rock Corp in New York. He was the director of operations and culinary director responsible for all front and back of the house operations of the Rainbow, including the Rockefeller Center Private Club, Rainbow Room, Rainbow and Stars Cabaret, Promenade Bar, Banquettes, Staffing, Union and Legal Issues, Budget and Culinary Development, Public Relations, Advertising and Marketing. And that was at the Rainbow Room. I mean, this, this thing was a giant and he had to oversee everything. And of course, he got three stars from the New York Times because he's awesome. Uh, from 89 to 95, he was at the Hudson River Club, New York. He was the executive chef and director of operations. Uh, it opened in, it opened in, in positioned highly regarded upscale restaurant. It was right on the river with a new cuisine based on local, regional, and seasonal products from the nearby Hudson Valley. And he stole my job. That was, I, was, I was applying for that same job, but we'll talk about that later. Um, prior to that, 1980 to 82, he was at the Leopard, Rest, the Leopard Restaurant in New York City. Um, it, it developed this, it was a one man kitchen in a semi private restaurant. And um, he did all the planning and designing efficiencies and operations, the public relations and marketing, the whole package. From 79 to 80, he was at La Cote Basque with Jean Jacques Rachou, uh, Jean -Jacques Rachou as the owner, Jean Jacques Rachou. I know him well. With design, construction, opening, and staffing of a, his newly restored restaurant. We shut down for a little bit of time. Um, 78 to 79, he was at Christopher's Restaurant in New York executive chef responsible for building kitchen decor menu staff kitchen management procedures for it was new at the time christopher's restaurant um uh, let's see 77 to 78 saint regis hotel new york uh, he was the executive sous chef union union liaison succeeded in reducing kitchen staff by 50 percent and opening a new king cole room it's because they all quit uh 76 to 77 <clears throat> the pier house hotel key west florida executive chef, assisted architects and interior designers in the opening of a 200 seat luxury restaurant with gross sales of over $4 million. David Wolkowski. All right, 1975 to 76, the Four Seasons restaurant in New York. He was a saucier um, and that, he was young back then. As a young American chef, he worked and learned in this fine restaurant, the art of making sauces and stocks and things from the extractions from the real thing. You hear bone broth now bone brought this. That's the only way it was. The only way you had to start with bones, you didn't really have anything. He was uh, educated at the CIA, Culinary Institute of America, and graduated in 75. He went to the University of South Florida, Florida State University, studying poli-sci and business administration. 
Uh, he's affiliated with the board of directors uh, and co-founder of Windows of Hope 9-11 Fund Chair uh, Emeritus, member of the Culinary Institute of America Alumni Council, blah, blah, everything else. Let's see. Personal, he's in excellent health. He's married, has two adult children, and I am super stoked to talk to an unsung hero of mine, Walden Maloof. You're the man. How you doing? Thanks for coming. I'm doing great, Rick. I think I'm going to hire you as my PR person. <laughs> <laughs> no, things are doing. Uh, things are going well. It's been a very uh, interesting and bizarre year, but for everybody. Yeah. But, uh, hopefully, we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel now, and um, so things will hopefully start to turn around. Our industry has been beat to beat down. Yeah. Beat down. Yeah, but, I know. But I just look. It's gonna, it's gonna get, it's gonna be fine, man. We know that yeah. it has to be. You know, we're gonna look back at this and go, "Oh my God, I was losing my mind." Yeah. Stop yeah. losing your mind. It's gonna, it's gonna figure itself out. We're gonna work it. Well, we both have a lot of friends in the, the industry, and we've yeah. been in the industry for combined over fifty years, maybe yeah. even more. But um, it's a resilient group. They'll bounce back. They'll, yeah. um, they'll come back uh, stronger than ever. Actually. Well, this podcast is all about you, my friend. So I, I, I don't even know a lot about your early years. I mean, I kind of met up with you through Charlie Palmer, I think. Yeah, I think so. And uh, then at the time, I think Burke, David Burke was working with you at La Cremaille. You know, David was work, work, David was my sous chef at La Cremaille for yeah. two or three years. And that was um, when I came back actually from... Actually, I came back from Europe. I was in Europe for about six months. And um, an old friend of both of ours uh, um, who owned Mark Sarazen, yeah, senior, uh, owned a, a great meat company in New York City. Uh, but he also seemed to broker American chefs. Uh, you see that, Wally? There he is. He's a great man. Shaking um, Marilyn, Marilyn Frubacino's hand. Yeah, he um, he introduced introduced me to Rashu. Yeah, and uh, and Rashu, you know, he would make fun. You know, he'd be, Americans they don't know how to cook; they can't cook anything. <laughs> and and uh, pretty soon, his entire kitchen was filled with uh, American chefs, most of them graduates of the of the culinary yeah. institute. And um, that's where you were. I was um, uh, Charlie uh, Charlie Palmer, Frankie. Uh, Frankie, a like bunch, of, bunch of other people, but uh, and I was the I was sort of the sous chef kind of because I was when Rashu bought the Le Cote Basque from Madame Henriette, who was uh, Henri Soule's Henri Soule was, was the original owner of Le Cote Basque. He also opened Le Pavillon, yeah, uh, in 1941 uh, when the when the there was a there was a um, 1939 World's Fair in Queens, and the war started in France, and the, and they had a whole bunch of chefs in Queens at the at the World's Fair, and they couldn't get back to um, they couldn't France. get back to France, so they stayed here and opened restaurants, and that sort of was the beginning of the the, the French movement, of, that, you know, that made the great great restaurants in, in New York City at the time. And Le, Co Le Pavillon was one of the original ones. Uh, in fact, Le Pavillon, I believe, was in the location Le Cote Basque moved to, the, uh, the one that we're in, that we were in. Right, Across exactly. That was their secondary, it's like the secondary restaurant, the Henri yeah, Soule. Yeah, yeah. And people that dining at that time would bring their wives to the, the one of them and their, and their uh, mistresses to another one. Yeah. That's yeah. the way it was. It's, it's, that's yet, the truth. Who inherited, who inherited the... Um, restaurant from Henri Soule. Um, she was Henri Soule's mistress. He had a wife in France. Right. So <laughs> this was, and, and she, she was in, she was the American wife. Um, but uh, uh, Rashu bought it from them. And I'd been working there with Amadie Lozak, who was the chef at the time for, for Madame Henriette. He was there for years. He went on to uh, become uh, George Soros's executive private chef and 
uh, <laughs> oversaw all of his um, homes all over the world for the last 20 years and lives up here now in the Hudson Valley. Yeah, yeah. We've reconnected. He's, he's a great guy. Uh, but the then uh, we did all kinds. We we did all kinds of things then. Um, one, I, one of the, I took your job when you were at like Code Boss. When we were working the line, you know, back in the early days when it first opened up, you were uh, the saucier, and mm -hmm. uh, and, and the I was I was the guy in the middle. I was the entremetier. I was like getting batted back and forth. I had to do these intricate designs of all kinds of vegetables, colors, purees, yeah. sauces. Yeah. I didn't have to do the sauces originally, but you left to go to uh, let's see here this place here, the, the pier house. How's that no. Oh, the leopard. Oh, look at that. How do you do that? That's, that's yeah, great. I, I stole it from you, man. You can you stole that from me. You want this? The Leo you want Pop. this? Ah, you do. Yeah. It, um, uh, it was named after, it was owned by an, an, a, a royal, a, a woman, a member of the Italian royal family. Okay. She was sort of the black sheep. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's named after her grandfather, who was the, basically the king of part of Italy. I'm not sure which part. Right. But, uh, and his, his nickname was the, the leopard. The leopard. And that's what he, he named. There was a movie with some famous movie star that played him uh, that was made like in the forties or fifties. So you were a one man kitchen, one man. Yeah. So you didn't have an assistant, nothing. You no. dishwasher, uh, I, nothing. There was, a guy that, there was a guy that would wash the dishes, vacuum yeah. the floor, clean the windows. And, um, anything else that needed handyman if the to toilets got backed up or something right. he, he was there and then it was me okay here's what i want to know who was dining there uh mostly un people but um let's see orson wells used to come there yeah uh david rockefeller used to come there <laughs> it's two doors down from lutes yeah i know i know exactly it's it's sort of a secret little restaurant and you had to be buzzed in by the this, by the major D, who was this giant of a guy, uh, gay from New Jersey, gay as hell, <laughs> and it was about six foot six, great, great man, a, a, a lot, a lot of fun. Vincent, um, I, I, I can't believe I can remember his name, but the, but I was there for a little, little over a, a year and a half, um, but eventually. After I was there about six months, it started getting busier. Right. Um, they always did a good lunch. It was pre-fixed lunch. I think it was, I think it was thirty-nine dollars at lunch, and this was in. So, I, don't know, I, look uh, good. I got your resume. I don't I'm good. Yeah, I got you covered. Eighty to eighty-two. Yeah, early eighties. Yeah. And, but it included four courses. And. Red and white wine, all you wanted. <laughs> And they were, it, but it, it was mostly uh, ambassadors from the UN because it's very close to the UN. Right. And, and she ha she was a very international woman, and everybody knew who she was, and and everybody used to pay in cash with a briefcase that's full of cash. <laughs> <laughs> that I, I Nothing don't know to see it here. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, it was uh, but it was a unique little place. There, there was, there was there was uh, four appetizers. Choice of four appetizers, two soups, one, two salads, four main courses, and four desserts. There was a couple of staples, and then other things changed. There was always a fillet. There was always some kind of fish. There was always some kind of bird, and then some other meat like lamb or veal or or or, or some, some some something like that. So, and, um, um, okay, I'm going to interrupt you because I'm moving this along here. Okay, okay so. You got sick of New York City, obviously, because you just hightail it up to Westchester. Oh, no, to uh, Connecticut, right? Bank no, Banksville. Well, we, were, we, were in, uh, we were in Westchester. Westchester, okay, Banksville. And then, then, we, moved to, then we moved to Stamford, Connecticut, and we, uh, when we opened the second beacon in Stamford. No, no, I'm talking about when you went to La Cremaille. Yeah. That, you went from yeah. Leopard to Cremaille, right? Yeah, okay. I went from the Leopard to La Cremaille. And uh, let's... That was... We, well... My son was born, and my wife got mugged, 
And I said, we're, we're out of here. We're not going to do this. And so Mr. Maizan, who also owned Le Caravelle in the city, had a country restaurant called Le Cremaire, uh, right on the Greenwich Bedford border. Uh, it had been, it had, uh, I have an ashtray from there, uh, but it was, uh, uh, he opened it in 1959. And a beautiful old house, um, Again, Mark Saracen intro introduced me to, to Mr. Maizan. Mr. Maizan had, uh, uh, or Monsieur Maizan. You know, oui. you just said it. Right. Oui. <laughs> and uh, he, he had never had an American chef or an American in the kitchen, never. And uh, he, he, he told me when he finally hired me, he says, I'm only hiring you because I'm desperate and you're not going to last more than three months. <laughs> Oh my God! No way! Is that really? I'm going to show you a picture. So you told me. Seven years later, <laughs> I um, there he is. I, so we moved up there and had my daughter and lived there. And then um, uh, I was going to, I was actually going to buy it from him, but then he decided not to sell it, uh, and um, we had, I ended up I. A, fr a friend of mine, Chris, Chris, Chris Carey, who was actually Governor Hugh Carey's son, right. who opened Christopher's, which was a restaurant that I worked in uh, earlier in that. He was working with a company that was opening four restaurants in the World Financial Center. Right. And I was helping him try to find a chef. And um, then eventually... Like, Colton, I just want to interrupt you. Yeah. Let's go back to Le Premier, because yeah. you trained... So many chefs that went on on their own to do amazing things. You were a springboard. You were a super connector as far as I'm concerned. I just want people to recognize that. So you're just rolling over things like, yeah, I did that. Yeah, it was Orson Welles. You know, yeah, he came in with Henry Kissinger and a couple of my friends. You know, you, you, it, 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 stop. This is, stu this is stupendous stuff. You know, so, so like from there, you know, I know David Burke trained under you 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 yes. you uh, were his you know his father at one point you really yeah. helped straighten him out in a manner that he learned the right way to to, to approach cuisine and now the guy's yeah. one of the most creative chefs out there he is, you know who, is who else far, who else did you work really who else exactly worked with you pardon who else worked there with you uh the, who, who else that, that, you, that you might know um he's I'm making you go way back now, my friend. Make it, make it, make it. Oh, you don't have to. Don't worry about it. Anyway, I just wanted to make a point. Go ahead. You, 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 can go, you can go to the Hudson River Club now if you want. I'll okay. You. <laughs> well, no, it, and it was, the Cremier was a great restaurant. Uh, it was, um, and Monsieur Maison made sure that uh, he knew his food like anyone I, you could ever know. He had $2 million worth of burgundy and, and Bordeaux in the basement of the place. It was a, uh, at the time, and that was when you used to go to France and buy wine and bring it back and hold it for ten years and then sell. Yeah, and and, and, that, and that's what. Um, and but it was we had movie stars, we had dignitaries, the Shah of Iran. Every Friday night, people would come from the city and to their Greenwich home, and and certain people had tables, and uh, you know it was it was it was it was funny. It was it was you know great. My memory of it, my memory of uh, visiting you there uh, when, while you were still, while you were the chef there, was going in the kitchen and, you know, and by a window with sun shining through it, you got a series of duck breasts face to face, hanging in cheesecloth on a string on a, on a broomstick. You know, I'm like, wow. You know, it, it intrigued me. I remember it to this day. I could smell the, the, your duck uh, ham that you were making. Yeah. Prosciutto you were making. It was so, it was amazing, you know. And I said, oh, you want a slice of it? Here you go. And there was the kind of camaraderie that, you know, we all had was, at a time, you know. The kitchen was about the size of a closet. It was, there was no air conditioning. No. And it was, it was uh, hotter than you can imagine. Uh, <laughs> One of the people that worked with me on the line was Pam Parsegan. Oh, Pam Parsegan. She's a, a journalist. writer for Restaurant News. And yeah. um, she was she, at this lunch. My roast too. cook. And um, <laughs> I, 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 this is a terrible story, but she, she um, poured, she was taking the roasting pan full of ducks roasting and all the 
fat was boiling in it and he just yeah, shook sure. it and she d- dropped it and it all went on her legs and her foot. Oh man. And so it was five o'clock on a Saturday night. She says, Chef, it hurts like hell, but I'll work through service and then I'll go after service to the hospital. And she did. No way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Pretty amazing. But we that did was, that, that was, though. But that was a type of camaraderie there was there. Um, mm-hmm. you, 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 got, you got through it. You sucked Martin it up. Howard, Martin Howard, who's probably one of the, one of the greatest pastry chefs in in new york mm-hmm. you know although he's not in new york anymore he was he was my pastry chef there um and uh, he actually followed me into the city when i went into the hudson river club which is right. where uh they were opening a restaurant uh, joe baum was consulting for the four people that were opening it and um his his company was was uh was consulting for it and his uh they built there was a uh, there was a um sort of a seafood restaurant in this uh big atrium huge atrium there that's still there but it got blown up at 9 11 but then it um uh it rebuilt. they rebuilt it and then the, and the hudson river club and the idea for the hudson river club was to try to use products and produce and things from around the area, but in, in, and, and in season. But in reality, I've been cooking like that all basically most of my life because that's how you cooked. That's you right. cooked what was, what was in the market and what was, so it wasn't like, okay, let's invent farm to table cuisine. Right. But there, it, it was, and, and there was no such thing at the time, nah. but this restaurant sort of, amongst others at that time in the city here and also was happening in San Francisco and parts uh, parts of California was this movement was happening that that uh, with for American food uh, based on what people wanted to started to want to know where their food was coming from yeah. what it was but but most good restaurants you go to Europe they go shopping at the market in the morning and they buy what, well that's what, what we're doing yeah, you were doing what uh, Europe has been doing for two two thousand years or whatever. Yeah. They, they, that's all they did. It's what they exactly. know. And it, we even did it at, at we did it at La Crema here. Uh, we did it to a degree at at um, La Cote Bass, but that was a little different of a type of cuisine. But uh, at La Crema here, which was a country restaurant, we went to the market every every Saturday up there. There were there were even produce markets, or we worked directly with the farmers. So at Hudson River Club, uh, I we I I, they, I started there in November, and they had been having a hard time opening. A lot of people have a hard time pulling the trigger on opening a restaurant. They, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you just you know, it's like they go there. Oh, we got to do this first. And then you got to do this first. And then you got to <laughs> you know, you just have to like stop and go. Okay, we're going to open tomorrow. So I, after I put together a little bit of a staff, I said, we're going to open on Thanksgiving Day. Oh, no. <laughs> Great idea, chef. Yeah. Well, at La Carma Air up in the country, I had been doing Thanksgiving for the last seven years, sort of French style. Right, right. So uh, um, I did it the same, and but just put everything in uh, American English terms and in talked about some of the farms where it came from right. and it and it went off real well we closed for the the weekend reopened on monday and that was that was it we were open but uh, there was a lot of issues there uh it, at the time you couldn't find fresh produce mm-hmm. and a union square there was market, no union square market at no, that time. it was it, it started about a year after that Right. And it, but it was small at the time, sure. And uh, but and it did grow, and we did use it a lot. And they tried to do a wholesale end of it, uh, but that didn't work too well. And that's where actually I got involved, re-involved myself with the Hudson Valley, mm-hmm. and um, be, because I came up here to the farms, and you know, farms already then were starting to go out of business, right? And and it was you know not not pretty. They still are. But a, a, a lot less, and 
there's finally a movement in the Hudson Valley that is actually making it almost a, a, a there's a lot of food interest now here more than, more than there was. Good. And but we would uh, first of all, you defined a true uh, New York regional cuisine. You did. You did mm -hmm. there at that time because you were empowered to do so. You took the, the you know the reins and you just yeah. you just ran with it and you created what a lot of people subsequently would, would copy from you. So we, we applaud you and thank you for that. Seriously. Highest form of flattery. <laughs> no, it's, it is but, what it is, pal. You know, you gotta, you gotta, gotta take the, take the bow when it's yeah. was, it was you. We know we got pictures. Yeah. There was, there was, there was a few others in the city doing some, doing some great things too, but I was sort of the, I, I pushed it. I mean, we came up here and we gave, we paid farmers money and would buy their crop ahead of time and ask them to grow things for us. Yes. And this is what I can use. I mean, uh, it, Mike Smith will tell you stories of where we, we got like a truckload of rhubarb and we didn't know what the hell to do with it. It all came all at once. And, and that happened a, a few times, but we <laughs> ended up finding chicken farmers up here, um, trap guys that were growing trout at the time, um, I mean, Shad and Shad Row were were still being fished out of the Hudson River. Right. Um, can't find it now at all. But um, in springtime, you don't see any Shad Row anymore. Not, no, not wow. not. There's some, and you can you can fish it, but it's you can't eat it yet. It's just like the striped bass. There's a lot of striped bass has come back, huge ones, but you, you can't really. There's still a problem with it. Um, but but it is cleaning up. We want to thank General Electric for this. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, and GM. Good job. And GM, yes. Thank you for and using IBM, the rivers and of IBM. Dump. And IBM. Uh, I mean, I want to talk later about aquaculture with you. So this is just, let's not paint that picture of water. It doesn't exist. Okay, what are right. you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're cleaning it up, and it is getting a lot better. Yeah, well, you we're can, getting smarter. You can um, eat. You go up a little further where the water's um, a little more brackish, there are very nice oysters coming out of the water now. Thank God. They used to be so, they were so prolific, they used to give them away free at bars to get people to drink more. Yeah, that, <laughs> and that, that's supposed to be a very good sign. The caviar. When the oysters are, are coming clean and bacteria free. Well, but they're, they're filter feeders, so they, they help. Once they show up, one yeah. oyster filters 50 gallons of water per day. So yeah. if you've got, you got a good, healthy um, you know, a population of these uh, oysters, that's real awesome. And I, yeah. think, and I think the pandemic helped. <laughs> yeah, probably did. Because no, you, know, sure it you leave nature alone, it comes back like, hey, how yeah. you doing? Here I am. Yeah. Yeah. been here all no. the time, but you've been stepping on me. Oh, absolutely. The, the pandemic, you can see it driving around. Out, out, you know, trees are growing where they didn't used to be. And it's yep. it's, it's, it's pretty pretty amazing yeah but um and then i ended up writing the hudson valley cookbook mm -hmm. the hudson river valley cookbook for uh up here and um that was pretty successful and um it, it helped the the restaurant and it helped you know you you had to, that was when you, the chefs had to start to become uh, a little bit of they had to represent the restaurants and it was if you you had to do this sort of just to get butts in the seats you had to like get out there and do tv shows and do radio shows which and, you're so comfortable with obviously <laughs> <laughs> all the wall wait time not. out time out there was one time okay this is a good story okay let's tell okay. stories okay remember it was you Charlie Palmer and myself, we were all on Sarah Moulton's show, cooking, whatever, I forgot the, it was her nighttime show. Yeah, she I made remember. a big mistake of inviting us three together. Now, you, for those listening, you understand Charlie Palmer is a very, very dear friend of ours. And um, we've, we've been through a lot of things together from private events, et cetera, et cetera, charities. Yeah. You just, the list goes on. But at this particular day, I was feeling a little bit, you know, in the mood to, to raise a little hell, let's so to speak. <laughs> so, you know, you get makeup, you know, individually they get called into the, the room to get makeup on. And in the waiting area, there's beers. So we're drinking beers. We're like we're old buddies. You know, we, we get together, you know, hey, you get thirsty, you have a beer or two. 
So I'm in the chair and I'm, 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 I'm talking to the girl putting makeup on me and I'm telling the terrible stories about you. I'm telling you, oh, this Wally Maloof, he's a child molester. I mean, I'm going down the line of things saying about you just to give you a hard time to get, because you were nervous. So you can tell, you're like, you know your stuff better than anybody, anybody. You know, I put anybody up against you, if, you know, in the back, back and just try two guys cooking, you're going to come out with a product that's like, wow, better. Truthfully, that's my, that, I know that about you. But here on this night, you're like, I don't know. You had to sear some lamb. I, I know that for a fact. So here we are. Sarah Moulton loses control of the show at one point. I don't know. She asked me something, and I went through my my uh, what I was cooking. Then it was Waldy's turn, and uh, I think Charlie was finishing up. Not sure of the order, but I remember you going up there and you're talking. You're talking about sear and the lamb, and we're all mumbling under our breath, you know, giving you a hard time. So you paid attention to us and didn't worry about anything. And then you took the lamb and you put it in the pan. The pan was stone cold. So it just went to the pan. Now I just go. I go into the mic. I went. And that was the day that I wish I wish uh, that uh, somewhere in the archives of all of Food Network stuff that I could find that someday and we'd laugh. Uh, uh, I, get, I, I will ask Sarah when I see her again. Oh. And, uh, she comes to the school every once in a while. Um, and I, we had a dinner with her a couple, two years ago. But I, I'll, I'll, I'll ask her. Yeah, that let's dig that up, Waldy. I'm going to tell you something. I remember doing the show. You would cry. <laughs> you, you would cry and, and, and find it hard to breathe. You know, it's like hanging out with Burke. <laughs> you know? Holy smokes. So, okay. So you went, you went to, uh, let's see, where are we at in your resume? Here? Where so, are we? I don't know, man. Right, let's, uh, go to, let's go to Beacon. Because Beacon was, you know, where I really got to know you as a chef running a restaurant in Manhattan cranking busy huge doors you got these gigantic doors to walk in you felt <laughs> like the place was alive there was wood fire burning smell of yeah. everything you're roasting oysters that everybody you got known for it was there were so many um facets to beacon tell mm -hmm. me about your experience at beacon the beacon was 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 and is probably still my favorite restaurant i've ever had i could see you were happy been involved in it yeah. was it was very much my personality we got to, we, I had a lot to do with building it. I built it. We left, we left Rainbow Room. I had been at Rainbow Room for four years. Right. Uh, and then we decided not to renew the lease with Joe Baum and David Emile. Uh, and so we, they, Joe and I sat in this empty room that, that it was a, a um, it was a Greek fish house mm -hmm. I forget the name of it for years uh and we sat there and we had talked about we we had been to restaurants in california that had that had these like outdoor grills and they were cooking on them and there was like well and then then I, we went i went to argentina with david emile and oh. you know, they're doing all these 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 uh restaurants with the grills you walk in and it's like 50 feet long and it's yeah. on an angle and they got the wood they're, they're constantly flames because they have to burn down the embers and sweep them under constantly yeah yeah well we and so joe and i i mean i don't know how many of you or your listeners know who joe Baum is but he's one of the greatest restaurant stores to li ever live Hell and man. i agree with you and he was he was brilliant he's he he opened over 300 restaurants in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. wasn't it well, great? Business? Even his, his, and his daughter, Jennifer, she's still around. She's, yeah. she's yeah, she continues she to be influential uh, and, and, in the industry as well. And and his, I think he had two sons. They're still around. Yeah. Uh, but he wasn't the best businessman, but he was un amazingly creative. But he could well, spend money really easily. We could talk about David Wolkowski. We, we jumped over that. Yeah, we jumped you know, over Okay, so I'm, I'm zooming way back when I was at like Cote Basque. Wally, Wally hooked me up with a, with a guy named David Wolkowski in Key well, West. I, wanted, I was I just, just going to ask you, what was it that, that we did in Key West? Because I couldn't remember. All right, here's the deal. We're at Le Cote Basque. We work side by side. You, uh, you split to become uh, the... Uh, to, to go to Leopard Club. So I stayed, so I got your job. So I became the saucier. Yeah. Rashu had promised it to two people in the kitchen, me and someone else. He worked the two against each other. It got kind of <laughs> ugly, but I ended up getting the job. Yeah. And I won't mention any like names. like to do that. Yeah, so he did that. And so I got the job. He was, which means, you know, you got your, the Jean-Jacques Rashu uh, you know, sign of approval. Yeah. So um, 
He was no. testing you. I, I needed to get out of there after two years. I know I had enough. I was burning out, whatever it was. I wanted to get out of New York City because it's where I grew up. I mean, I, knew, I was all in New York. I didn't yeah. see anything else going on anywhere else. So mm -hmm. I wanted to get near the water. And you told me, oh, I used to be, uh, I used to run the pier house for this guy, David Wolkowski. You know, we're really good friends. Let me hook you up with him. He's looking for somebody. You told me, you gave me that job. You handed it to me. So I flew down to Key West. I met with David Wolkowski. I went straight from the airport to the to the resort, met with him, and went back home. I, I didn't know the resort. I didn't know the area was um, predominantly um, uh, gay. You know, gay. 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 <laughs> you could say gay. It's a, it's I didn't know that. I didn't know that going in there. So I so I go back and I accept the job. Well, and I leave La Cote Basque, and off now I am from. Uh, I was living in New Jersey, working in New York City at La Cote Basque. I mean, at the, yeah, look up. So now I'm going to, uh, on my way to Key West, Florida with my buddy. And I'm down there and it's just a show. <laughs> There's so much, it's, it's, a, it's a zoo. It's, you're working for this, the, the absent minded professor who's walking yeah. around, David Wilkowski, telling me stories. He said, Hey, Rick, come here. You know, I need the chicken salad to be more fluffy. Fluffy. <laughs> can you make it fluffy for me. I'm like, fluffy. I didn't learn that at culinary school. So I went in there as a sous chef. You right? told all the chefs that, you know, uh, can you get that? Can you make this chicken salad more fluffy? <laughs> God <laughs> rest his soul. He told you, he told, he, uh, what's his name? The other guy that uh, he, he told everybody. Oh, yeah. There's other chefs that went in and out of there. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I, I brought Charlie Palmer down and Frank Crispo down, and they both came. And I wanted them to consider coming on board with me because yeah. I got thrown into the executive chef position instantaneous with David Wolkowski telling me, don't worry, Rick, you'll be fine. I was yeah. totally underqualified to, to run this resort. It had the five, the ten-speed grill, the the thing yeah. out on the pier, and then in the ocean room that they opened up. So I got three operations thrown in my lap because the executive chef and his boyfriend, the the general manager, skipped off in the sunset together because they got fed up with it all. So they got they, they got tired of Morton. They came from Morton's and, and they were great guys, and I learned a lot yeah. under them. But I had to learn trial by fire there, man. And so I brought Charlie and Frankie it down to. It was my first real chef job. And when I went down there, the beach club was only the only thing that was open. Now and you're the at the pier house. house was under construction. And I had to, so I had to work on the beach beach house was a, a while while the pier house was under construction. It was finished by I went I think I went down in December. And then um, and then I, I we were we went into the restaurant that summer. But it was huge. I know. And, no, these were monsters. And I, and I David just kept adding on and on. No, David didn't follow any of the guidelines or rules of you know, construction, oh, no. per permitting and stuff. No, no, just, just, just build another room there. We'll just tell him it's a you know, yeah. bathroom. You know, yeah. seats fifty. Yeah, he was, he was, he was incredible. Well, <laughs> he, he, owned was there... the, he owned the city. I mean, he owned the whole town. He, oh he, yeah, he, yeah. He's the he king was, of Conk. He, he was instrumental in bringing the writers there and a lot of the gay community there. Yeah. And, uh, but it's mixed in with the Air Force and the Army and the, and the Shrimpers. And the, it's, a, it's a mix of people. Yeah. It's, 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 that's, it's, it was colorful days. I, I haven't been there uh, in, a, in a long time. David passed away. I know. About two, two, two years ago. Yeah, I heard. I spoke ago. to him a couple of times. I went down to visit him, too. Yeah, me too. A few years back. He did a, there's a great obituary on him in the New York Times. If you oh, ever it was, it was good but um he was a character uh because i was associate at the four seasons restaurant okay the yeah okay where the, the pool room the, the pool yeah, room yeah. on park avenue i was i was associate there uh 28 sauces had to be ready by 11 o'clock <laughs> well, i don't know i, I was associate at the coat boss i was analyst sir Oh, all kind of, but I get it. So, so one day, this man walks into the kitchen, and with another guy, and he, you, there was, in the Four Seasons kitchen, there was a service bar uh, when you came in from the dining room, right, right in the, right. in the, kitchen. and so he walked up to the bartender in the service bar, and he says, "I want to know who cooked my lunch." And he says, "Well, what did you have?" And I don't know what he told him. And he said, well, that gentleman, right, that kid, that boy right over there, I think that's what he used, that boy right over, the, right, right over there. Where's and it was David Wolkowski. Ah. See that? 
You know who that is, right? Yeah, I know. With, with Drew and what John George Wong directing. Look at yeah. JJ. Oh, look at him. Yeah, I guess. I, I don't know. Look at Drew. <laughs> I know. Drew. Yeah. I, yeah. No, you know, Drew's looking good. You should send me a copy of that picture. I will do so. I you can just take a, even just take a picture of it. Yeah. But um, so he, so he comes, Dave Rokowski comes walking in and he said, that was something to the effect that that was the best duck or whatever it was that he fluffy had potato, ever in fluffy, his life. I fluffy guess it chicken was fluffy salad. Enough. <laughs> and he, uh, he, he, uh, he said, I have a, I'm opening a restaurant in Key West, Florida. Do you want to fly down and take a look at it? And I said, oh, well, I can think about it. And he said, well, here's $600 for your airplane ticket. And, you, and here's my phone number. You let me know when you can come down and, and take a look at it. <laughs> Most unconventional businessman you'll ever meet in your entire life. And I'm standing life. there going, okay. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the guy next to me said, what? Who is that? And then I, I have no idea. But um, I did end up flying down there and um, decided to take it. I thought it would be good for me to open a restaurant and take a chef's job outside of the city, sort of like a theater person or, you know, take a play on the outside and, and, yeah. and then, and then bring, you know, bring it into the, then bring it back to the city. And sort of, that's sort of what happened that you did the same thing. Uh, yeah. You, 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 you yeah, I came back outside. Really. Well, let's see. It was, uh, I started out at La Cote Bosch, then I went to Key West, and I came back and worked at Le Cirque eventually, but through a very, very short stint at the Polo Club. What was uh -huh. it called? Yeah, I think it was called the Polo Club. Oh, and I was doing, so I was a saucier there, but what that meant was compound butters on their wood fired grill. That's all it was. And I'm like, this isn't going to work. And I got, a, I got a phone call and ended up working at Le Cirque when Sirio Maccioni called me. Found out yeah. later it was kind of a revenge thing to kind of snub Jean Jacques Rossu because they weren't friends. <laughs> one guy stole, somebody stole somebody from somebody one time. And, yeah. then, it's the, yeah. and, it's, and then it's the McCoys and they the, the Hatfields. But they were still friends. <laughs> Oh yeah, of course. We all got along, man. I'm just saying, though, there was definitely that tension. So yeah. and that was those were fun. So okay, I think I stopped you in the middle of Beacon because uh, Beacon was yeah. uh, to me. I, I loved, 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 loved going to Beacon. It was one of my favorite yeah. places. Well, it was a great. It had a great feel to it. You walked in. It was two stories high. You could you could smell the fire a little bit. You could. I mean, it, it, and we were there for fourteen, almost four, 14 years. Yeah. Uh, the uh, and it just had a patina, it eventually had a patina to it, and the bar was all along the side. It just it just really worked. It was busy and, though. Yeah, and we were busy. You were we, cranking. I mean, everybody was there. What did, um, okay, so who'd you serve there of note? Uh, you always have a list of people. Uh, if it, President if these Clinton questions suck. Just saying, came a couple sucks. of times. Clinton came a couple of times. Cuomo used to come a couple of times. The father. Right. Um, yeah, the, who, who who was, um, and actually we did, I did, uh, um, our current governor Cuomo, I used to do his, we did his daughter's fifth and sixth and seventh birthday party wow. uh, when, when, when he, when he was still, uh, married. Uh, but the, and there was a lot of agents in the area. So a lot of, uh, a lot of actors and, um, would 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 come with their agents and work out their deals. Uh, we had uh, Danny DeVito was there once, and next to him was Elliot Spitzer. And the next chip next uh, the and he was had just resigned as governor or whatever because he liked New Jersey hookers or something. <laughs> but <laughs> the, they they their guests left. The two of them. I mean, if you know, if you know, remember Elliot Spitzer, he was a, a very like well dressed, elegant man. Mm -hmm. And Danny DeVito is not, not so much. Dressed, not elegant so much. Man. <laughs> they spent four hours talking and having and having a great time. And they just and basically got drunk together. That's and it funny. was just hilarious. <laughs> That's an awesome yeah. story, man. Uh, what's his name? The governor from New Jersey. Was trying to run for president. Kerry, no. What it wasn't no. Kerry? Chris Kerry. No, that no, was current. Uh, no, he was a friend of Trump's. Republican, I'm not, I'm not, big guy. 
was just just um, recently. He's still around. Um, well, he and Cuomo had a summit, and they took over my banquet space, and um, the, 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 just the two of them and their and their guards, and um, one table for two. They they one table, and they they were, they were talking about the Port Authority. And no, and nobody could listen to them because they were trying to make deals about bridges and tunnels and Port Authority going. Wow. And um, the, the the their Secret Service said they won't drink. It's going to be a quick dinner, and they don't eat much. Uh, he ate two double portions of salmon. They drank four bottles of wine, and they had and. And and the New Jersey guy, you know who I'm talking about. He's a big the guy. He's on the beach. He's a big fat man. He had, he had a porterhouse for two. That doesn't days. narrow it down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, but so a, a lot a lot of people a lot of people came there, and we we got pretty famous for our grilled items and wood roasted items, and uh, we didn't use the, we didn't use the wood burning oven for pizzas. Well, actually, we did some flatbreads, but we didn't really didn't use it for pizza. I was using it as an oven. Yeah, an oven. And, and 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 by I I, dis, I discovered. I mean, I don't know how I discovered or if I discovered for myself anyway that that the smoke and the char and um, um, adds flavor. Yeah. Uh, and 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 it's like a, it's like an ingredient. So I used to use the oven as an ingredient almost yeah. and yeah you know even ash would get on something or something and it was uh, and and it really made the f food unique it flakes off when it's supposed to flake off and it's yeah. pure carbon it's the purest form it's been through 800 degrees for probably a uh, seven days and it yeah. flaked off and it got on your food that's the carbonara that's the the carbonara you know that's like the it's the yeah. And people have been eating ash all their lives. There's nothing yeah. wrong with it, but it is, mm. it's grit. It's delicious. It's a live yeah. fire. Your yeah. food's alive. Your restaurant was alive. You were alive. It was yeah. your happiest time of your life. I it just, I, I appreciate spending some uh, memory time with you on, on the beacon. Because it, 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 re it really was. It was, uh, it upset me to close it. Mm -hmm. uh, our 15 year lease was mm -hmm. up. And, um, this will shock maybe some of your readers, but we were paying um, thirty-four thousand dollars a month rent. That's an, that's ridiculous. And then and then it's low. <laughs> well, they wanted they wanted to raise it to one hundred and twenty. Yeah, uh, that's, that's uh, incremental. <laughs> incremental. <laughs> From a landlord who's pissed off how successful you've been for the last fourteen years. That's what happens. So we, we said. We said. Why would we do that? We're work now. You want us to work for you, and and you know. And so, eventually, my partner and I, after like two or three meetings, and he wasn't budging, we said, "Okay, we're not gonna, we're not renewing it. We're we're not we're not doing this." And yeah. that's when my wife and I decided to um, that we didn't want to open another restaurant in the city. And um, the president of the culinary was was um, knew that he was expanding the the school to a degree and trying to get the restaurants that he had in, in a little better financial shape. And um, he kept asking me to come and I kept saying, no, I was going to, I was determined to do something in the city. Yeah. And, uh, but just then eventually decided not and came up, did came up here and uh, uh, amazingly, I think I've been here Oh, eight years now. Wow! But it's uh, I I really enjoy it. I I work with the, I I don't teach per se, but I do work with the students a lot. Yeah. And uh, and and the instructors and like you said in the beginning, we did um, I have built or built or renovated one restaurant a year since I've been here, wow. <laughs> and then. The last year has been. We obviously we're not building anything right now, mm -hmm. uh, but we we bought Copia, which is a, uh, yep. a Julia Child's place, along with yeah. uh, we got to uh, make some wine. Mondavi. Yeah, him. 
I spent spent a lot of time there. Well, you, I saw you out there. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've been to Copia quite a few times. Yeah, I'm involved in a project um, right next, going towards yeah. the train tracks there. Yeah, um, on the other right. side of on the yeah. other side of. Yeah, it's, um, called, Trunk. it's called Trunk. Feasted Forward. Yeah, you should we should yeah. we should meet He's up. Still, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be going out there. I don't know, maybe simultaneously. You still involved with that? Yes, I am. It's oh, uh, it's actually expanding. So Katie Schaefer, who runs that, she's very prolific. She's got a lot of stuff going on. So I'm going to be doing some. We're talking today, actually. I told you, told me later. So uh, later, okay. yeah, later, later, later. So but, I mean, you have twelve restaurants. You're overseeing all of them. I mean, is this is this because I had the same I had the same idea. I'm never going to stop working ever in my life. Yeah. You know? I mean, if I, I wake up one morning and I'm making an egg and I keel over and die, I win. I want. Yeah. I win. That's it. I get it. You know. Yeah. I don't care. I, I like agree. doing this. I'll do it again. I'm thinking of opening a restaurant. No, you of my own. <laughs> Give me a call after this, please. Please, Waldy, don't don't do it. Holy smokes! But you're happy. You're in Hyde Park. It's beautiful yeah. up there. It's, 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 I mean, life is stressful right now, so it's going to yeah. be hard for you to wholeheartedly, without it lying, is. saying yeah. it's great. But I mean, but I've always worked. You know, basically, I've always worked for myself. Yeah. And I've rarely um, worked in a in a corporate environment. And and higher education is really uh, different, but and I really do enjoy it. But sometimes you miss own, owning excitement of it all, having your own. Yeah. <laughs> but I now I have the twelve, and the payroll's not mine, and the food cost isn't mine. And uh, if there's a problem, the HR department takes care of it. <laughs> well, you know. So, I'm uh, right now. I'm you know master development chef for a company out of Houston. I don't own a restaurant. I had to close my restaurants two years ago after that shooting, on October first, out of Mandalay Bay. It's deteriorated everything around me. I'm out. So I'm also the brand ambassador for, for you know for Erosion. It's a new Kahala that they have coming out. It's a fish. Um, would you like to have some uh, seafood sent to you directly, chef, to play with? Would you like to play sure, with? Sure, I would love that. I would love that. That's what we're going to do. That's not, I'm baiting you right now. So, I, you know, you've been, oh my God, you've thrown, we didn't even get a chance to talk about the millions of private events that you have coordinated, organized. I mean, you've done fair sized, like it's a, like a, like a county fair sized event. Yes. You coordinated this stuff. <laughs> you're, you're out of your mind of things you've done and the people you've connected with and then the relationships that you have. Do you miss all of that? I mean, you got to miss all. I, I, yeah, to, I, I do. I mean, I, I stay in touch with some people, um, but uh, I, I miss, I miss some of that. I mean, I, I, you know, doing, you know, a party for Billy Joel at his house in out in Long Island for mm -hmm. five hundred people. That's yeah, uh, something like that. Special little old thing. <laughs> the. Uh, things like that were, were pretty special. Do, doing, we did. We used to do a lot of parties in that uh, Hudson River Club. Okay, and, but you had you had people that would order the would rent the trucks, order mm -hmm. the things. You just had to review the list of things that you needed. Ah, throw a, twenty more extra sheet pans. We always need those. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. Like you're standing in mud, we could stand on the sheet pans. You know, <laughs> that's what you had to do. We've, done it. We've done it. I know. I, I know. That's why I said that. You've you know? done it, but. I never i I liked the I liked doing the special events, but I never I never ever thought of wanting to you know open a special events company or something. Right. But but the Christopher one e. Doan. Do you know Christopher E. Doan? Right? Yeah. yeah. Salad yeah. days and uh, uh, glorious food. Glorious foods. Man, I'm that, sorry that, was, that you didn't want to do that. No, I didn't want to do that. But but the one offs were good and and they were always fun. Sure, uh, Charlie helped me with the with the Billy Joel party. Did you? No, you weren't. Not the there. Billy Joel party. I had to do a party for the guy that brought in Chris Stahl, his, his tutor home in Connecticut on Derby Day. And we were roasting whole pigs. Charlie Palmer. I don't know if you were involved in that one. I don't. I don't think I, I was involved. The guy's now. name. He had his, you know, his own caveat too. So. It was, <laughs> You know, Charlie was eventually went to jail because the caviar wasn't what it was said was a label or something. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff we could yeah. talk about. That's that's uh, off record. It's, it's going to be do, Charlie. You, again. me, and Let's David Burke have to do an off the record OTR. That's what we'll call it. OTR. Okay. You sign it at your own risk, not the chips. 
man. So anyway, um, talk to me what your feelings are about aquaculture. I just like to hear just generally, you know, in your career, you've seen a lot of the things you've had fresh trout and, ch- and char out of the and, and sturgeon out of the Hudson River. I've always tried to, just like using the farmers and things, you, you know the food's better when it's either grown better or, or treated better, mm-hmm. or it's just, it's going to be better. Yeah. And, and, and the people that are around it are going to take care of it in a different way than some guy working at, um, in some f- dirty fish market somewhere. Right, uh, right, right. It's just going to be, and, and so, so we always worked with, um, I mean, worked with very good fishermen or, yeah. or fish, fish purveyors, or whatever you want to call well, we them. We bought from Raza and we didn't buy from Slavin. You know, it's just right, under right. Law. <laughs> yeah. So because and, of how they handled the business. Yeah. And, and it tastes better. And and you respected it more. Yeah. And and you, I mean, yeah. Now, I mean, it's it's also part of the sustainability movement and and all this, and because we've seen what's happened to waters that were not taken care of, mm-hmm. and we and we see it all all the time. And then the, then the fishes becomes terrible, and you know, salmon instead of two dollars a pound, all of a sudden becomes fifteen. And um, you know the, the, the prices are outrageous, the, yeah. the, but uh, the that's that's what's happened. So it's important. I mean, well, it's just you know, shopping. aquaculture went through a learning curve. Well, the, yeah. you know, it really did. It had to. It was because it was growing quicker than people could research how to do properly. And right. when you put them and you sit on nature, because the first place you set up your aquaculture farm is where the fish already are, because. They, they've chosen that area it's because it's perfect it's ideal they can reproduce it's good for them so that's yeah. where you target your farm and now you put you kind of put an elbow into their knee a little and then another one another one with, with more and more fish that weren't there originally you're overpopulating it you're adding some yeah. stress all these things they didn't know how to handle it it took them years to figure it out now they get it it's further out to sea some things like this kahala is on hawaii way off way offshore robotically fed so there's no 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 waste whatsoever and if the, I had, I, I've been, I've worked with the fish, and I'd like to get your feedback on it. It's absolutely the texture, the flavor, yeah, the nutritional I value. I don't think I've ever worked with it. Um, it's an amberjack. Yeah. Okay. All so, right. Yeah. So That's you, what I was going to ask. You know, you, what, what's it like? Yeah. It's an amberjack. It's in the jack family, but it's, it's, you know, a few more generations of what they're, what they're doing. They're going to have their own, you know. Uh, permutation i would say or better they, the what they're feeding etc is changing their genetic codes a little bit i think they're getting, they're getting better and better so you know they're going to first release uh, later this year so you know it's just going to be super cool to get your input because I'd love, to me I'd love, to, I'd love to try it I'll, I'll i'll give you some ideas or something all right man you always have yeah, yeah always, I, I, mean, I remember throughout the years just calling you up just to, just to, <laughs> to feel better not always you know i'd call you up to laugh and stuff i mean if, so, if i was down for some reason though you were always the guy that would just uh, ah, man, <laughs> come on relax give mark sarah's yeah, a call yeah. he'll, he'll figure it out for you it, it, I, it works out yeah these things work out but, well uh, i just i want no, to give you you've always been one of my one of one of, one of what i consider one of my best friends oh, thank and you thank still, and, and definitely still are you know I don't know if it's chefs or because we're men, but you sometimes you know you don't connect. You don't connect with enough people sometimes in the right way, or maybe we're just getting old. <laughs> well, you know what? We just took everything for granted because we were just yeah. charging forward with you know stupid might. You know, like you like you would you would charge hell with a bucket of water, Waldy Maloof. You're not afraid. Party mm-hmm. of a thousand, sure. Hang up the phone. How are we gonna do that? Holy shit! I don't know. Call my well, friends. What are you? We're gonna. Hey, Palmer, you're coming in. We're doing it. We're getting the band back together. You know. It's, it's that kind of love and camaraderie that I, I wanted. I wanted to uh, commemorate that on our, our podcast, Ocean Base. And no. I've, got, I've already held you over an hour, my friend. Thank so you I'm for like, thank I'm you like, for I'm like a, I'm like a no, Thanks for asking me. I'm I'm honored. Well, you. Uh, I want people to realize that Waldy Maloof is a name that you should know. He's uh, had a, tr- a tremendous amount of impact and influence on 
a lot of the talent that's uh, uh, that built this uh, industry as well. So you you like you built all the steel girders, you know. Nobody knows the guy that built the steel girders in the, in the final product. They know I am Pei was the designer or something. Yes. So you're the steel girders to <laughs> so much more I'll than people it. take it. I'll take it. Spot. And, but I had uh, a lot of other people working with me making it go- making it work. That's what you're supposed to say. Good job, Chef. Oh, man, I love you. Thank you for your time. I'll talk to you soon, my friend. I love you too. Take All care. right. Bye. Bye. Foreverocean.com.